Hi there guys, I'm Chris Bowden and welcome to the Geek Group. In today's equipment autopsy, we have this nifty thing, which is a Perkin Elmer LC600 auto sampler. And I've messed with this auto sampler a couple times. I cannot figure out where the audio in, audio out, any MIDI controls, I can't get it to sample at all. So I figured we'd make it into an equipment autopsy. I'm going to begin with the plug. Let's see what it does. Oh, it goes ting. you've got a machine that goes ting. What makes that sound? Oh, this is going to, okay, we're going to find out how it, and why it makes the sound. But this is a thing used for chemistry, and that's everything I know about it, because, well, my profound understanding of chemistry is the stuff of legend. I'm going to get rid of this giant cat whisker off the side, because it's just annoying me. Okay, fine. Be that way. You want to play it like that? I can do that. Ha! All right. And I'm going to begin with the back because there's a couple thumb screws which make this relatively easy to open. Oh, wow. Oh, this is neat. Here, I'll turn this around so you guys can see. There's, there's stuff going on in there. This is kind of obnoxious to get into. Oh, there's a vial. It's labeled WV or CCV. I don't know, but that's our vial. Here, I'll turn it here and you can get a shot of it. I don't know what's in it. It is a pale yellow liquid I'm going to say it's CCV. That might make sense to somebody out there, but all right. Now we know things. There's a little widgy bit and a needle and this vial. So I think, and I'm sure somebody out there would be happy to comment if I'm wrong, but I think this is designed for little vials like this to go in there and it works its way around. All right, we're in, I put it in 34. It's in 34. Okay, so the bottle's in position. Now let's sample. 10, 9, 8, 7. I'm going to turn this around so you can see in the back. 3, 2, 1. Nothing happens. And it just goes back to 14. And I've got my vial back. This will be worth millions someday. I'm saving that. All right, so let's dig into it. It's really well built. Like, the majority of this thing is just one big casting. So, I think I can probably just take this off right here. Oh, wow. Hey, guys, check this out. Check this out. All right. I gotta get my cable. We got a cool bit here. This is a rotary encoder right here. Oh, well, you're quite serious about that. Big solenoid, gear drive, and this here is a really simple rotary encoder etched into this brass disc. You can see these markings in that, and might be simple binary.
Okay, we're at one now. Let's open it up and take a look. It might just be binary. And if it is, we get to talk about counting in binary. That'll be fun. Oh, that's a terrible screwdriver. That is a less terrible screwdriver. Now, most rotary encoders have some kind of particularly awesome method for, oh! Oh, okay, cool. Some nice little brass bits. I'm gonna get a tray. So, we've got our disc here, and I'm gonna take this off. This is either brass or anodized aluminum. The color made me think it was brass at first, but as I'm looking at it, there's this weird iridescent pattern in it, so it may be anod, no, that's brass, that's heavy. All right, so we started here, and that was our zero. All right, so let's see if we can zoom in on the disk here. I'll try and get this in position where you guys can see it good. Now, this is our position zero, straight across. And all we have is this outer mark in here. Now, the outer mark appears all the way around. So this is our index to know you're at a hole. You've lined up. So we can ignore these. So we go here and we have a hole, one bar. So there's one. And then we go here and there's two bars open. So that tells us it's not binary. Because if it was binary, it'd be dot and then over here for two, and then both of those for three. Wait, 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 dot, and the next one over here for two, and then both of these for three. It is binary, because we've got one, two, two plus one is three, four, four plus one is five, 4 and 2 are 6, 4 and 2 and 1, and do, 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 do. So this isn't binary. That's kind of cool. We have a binary counting wheel. And I'll take a minute because you can't be bothered to go over and watch the awesome, like, I'm sure Number File has a cool video on it or something like that or something Tom Scott did, who is awesome. But here's some fundamental basics on counting in binary. You have... Binary is a base two math, so everything is either zero or one. So you start with, I'll do it top down, but you start with one. So that is one. To go to two though, you go two in binary looks like 10 because it's two from here and none from here. Three is one, one because you take two plus one. This is the two's place and the one's place. F and for four, you go one, zero, zero, like that, and up and up and up. And the spaces are really simple. You just start counting by twos. So you have one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, two, 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 like that. And that, by the way, is if you've ever spent any time around computers, it's why memory sizes are always 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. Yeah, like gigabytes, same thing. So it's a binary wheel, and that is awesome, and I am keeping that. What can we dig into next? I don't think we're going to get anywhere. Yeah, that's, this is all casting. There's no screws on the outside. So I'll take the plug off of it. Set that aside for a moment. And grab a screwdriver that does not suck. I'm back to the screwdriver that sucks. And I'll take these screws out of the back real quick here. And then I'll turn that around and open it up so that you guys can see.
Now this, by the way, is a Perkin Elmer, I think. Yeah. Model LC241. And I'm going to want to take that off because that's going to cause me a headache. And we'll turn this around and get a look inside. It's well packed. I think we're going to have to give it a haircut to get that open. All right. Good pair of cutters and just have at it. There's a lot of screws on the bottom. There's some cool bits. All right, this is going to be fun. This is more fun than I was expecting. There's some exciting stuff in here. It went in the hole, so I have to believe it'll come out. Got it. All right, so we get rid of all of that, which we don't really care about. There's nothing exciting there. But now we can see in there. And I'm going to let you guys get a look in there while I dig for a better screwdriver like this one. And let's see if we can open this up in a big way. Because I think I can drop the whole bottom right off of it. I don't know anything about chemistry. But I've taken apart quite a few pieces of fun chemistry equipment. And that tends to end well because chemistry equipment has all kinds of, especially when you get into... As a rule, any kind of scientific big testing equipment you take apart, you tend to find really unusual and fun things inside. You have to be careful because some of them can be just way more dangerous than you were expecting. You know, you're not taking apart toasters. And if you go in knowing you're taking apart like uh, something like an X-ray mass spectrometer or something like that, you, you know it's inherently dangerous and there's things inside that will hurt you. But with stuff like this, with an auto sampler, the more mundane stuff, you tend to find some pretty interesting and unusual for the average home tinkerer parts to come across. And you have to be careful with that. All right, you're coming out. That's going to have to feed through that. One. Yep, like that. Come on out. Oh, there's a little gear drive of some manner. All right, we don't, we don't need that. Oh, I thought that was a tube. There's actually a little, either a wire or a really tiny, tiny tube inside that. So I'm going to cut it because it's not worth fighting. And we'll lay this down. We've got more tubes and a little chamber and plugs. I'm going to take out all the plugs. Because despite my rather wanton nature, I try not to just arbitrarily destroy things. So this is a this is a pressure regulator. You can tell by the funny knob. So we've got a that'll come right out like that. This is going to take a little doing. This is, I don't know what this is. Here's a little reservoir. So we've got all kinds of interesting bits and pieces. So this is fun. Over here, I don't know what this thing does. We've got a power supply here. I don't want to just cut things. Let's see if we can remove you gently. I'm going to get it out as intact as I can. OK, we're going to have to take that top off. And that's held on by these. Ah, 
that did it. Now we'll do the bottom two. We'll be back for you. This just gives us the connection to the display. Which is not going to come out without a fight because it's wedged up in there. So I'll just get rid of that whole thing. And this is a big piece of like it's this huge piece of heavy duty casting plastic and it can go away this thing's built like a tank you can tell it's designed to be a quality piece of equipment and live for a very long time on a bench somewhere so how do we get this out some kind of intact you can go out you can go out all right, so here's basically what's going on. I'm just going to kind of put this back together a little bit to give you an idea. I can make it line up. It might not go back in there now that I've removed so many pieces, but we'll try. There, that goes there like that. So what this does is you have your little vial in your thing. And the vial comes around to the right position. And there's a little needle here that pierces the vial and goes down into there, takes its sample, and the in out suction, all that's controlled by these here. And then it retracts and if it retracts properly, this can spin out and you get your vial back. This is when I'm going to find out that the actual vial in there is like some form of monkey pee and now I'm going to get Ebola or something. So we'll be really careful around the needle because I don't know where you've been. Well, there's going to be, this is mounted somehow. And this is controlled. You can see, this is actually kind of cool. I don't know how well you can see it. But this here is not a, a fluid reservoir as I first thought. It's actually a hydraulic or pneumatic cylinder. And you can see the piston in there going up and down as I move this, which is kind of cool. It doesn't get me. Well, I only see one thing that could be the actual mount, and I might be able to get that up. I'm going to try. No, I can't get that lucky. Well, broken clocks right twice a day. Do it! Oh, you suck. The internet will never be sure if it was blind luck or skill, but I will know. Oh, you bitch. Okay, well that's, that's a, that's a part of it. No! 
What, what holds that? Oh, from the back. There's a secret hole in the back. Can I get in your secret hole? No. I don't have the links. All right, so I have my little wrench. And we can loosen that. And I'm going to attempt to just slide that out. And now I have the stabity needly bit. Well, that's the one I cut the other end off, so we don't care about that. Where does this end go? Well, I can't get this through that hole, and I can't get that through this hole, so... This is totally safe and in no way dangerous. Can I just unscrew that? Maybe. More importantly, can I do it without stabbing myself in the eye with the giant needle in front of me? No, that doesn't want to come out. Okay, I have to cut it. And I will feel sad about that. Okay, so there is the needle, and I am setting the needle way out of range. Now I can slide that off and slide that off. Can reach in here, retract the pin, pull that out. That just goes to the pressure gauge. That's all that's a light. So if I set that there, there's probably a plug. Yes, there is a plug. So I can unplug the light. Pull that out, so this can come out intact. Where's, there's my little cup, okay. So I can put this back in here, like that. Put my little cup back on, which is a bushing. Okay, and now this whole assembly piece to get out. That's the pressure gauge. Normally I don't take this much care to remove things intact, but on this particular project I'm trying to because there's some good pieces and this is actually useful stuff. I just wish I knew how to undo these little crimp fittings they have on everything. But this Unscrew that. Cool. Pop that out with its mount. Put that back together. I'm sure the nuts are around here somewhere for it. And I can screw this back into to the pressure regulator. where it will, of course, leak the next time I go to mess with this. Put a little goop and some tightening, and it'll be cool. Now, there. Ah! That's the little nut I wanted. There was only one in here. Apparently, the other one was lost at some point in this thing's history. But you only really need one, and it'll be fine. So I've got a little pressure gauge. It goes up to 30 PSI. I've got a pressure regulator. I've got this thing, which I don't know what it is. But it might be some kind of valve or something. And then over here, 
And I can cut these off because we don't, we don't need these, but this is neat. There's these four little coils, and they all have tubes, and they're all connected to this big brass thing. So I get to teach you guys about manifolds. So let's pop this off and get a look at it. That's an unusual screw in there. That's kind of weird. Huh, okay. So I'm going to cut off those two. Okay. We'll save that one for last. Now, here, this little widgy bit. Now, these are labeled Anger Scientific, A-N-G-A-R Scientific, a subsidiary of ASCO. And they have 100 PSI on them, which tells them they're good for 100 pounds. And then N, 24 DC. So these work on 24 volts DC. That means if I take one of these and put 24 volts on it, you'll probably hear a little click on one of those, which would be really hard to get on mic, so I'm not going to worry about it. But just trust me, if you put electricity on it, they click. But what these are are little tiny valves. And they're on, they share this center bar, which is a manifold. You'll see they all have a tube coming out, but the tubes going in are on the other side. And that's this brass bar here. So these. One of them is the supply side. It's just got to pass through. It heads off somewhere else. But so this is where our gas, like compressed air going in, goes. And then when you apply electricity to the coil on one of these valves, they're like a little solenoid valve. That trips the thing, and then the air can come out and go down the wire, or the, the tube. So these are little solenoid valves, and they're good for up to 100 pounds of pressure. And they take 24 volts DC to work. And they're pretty cool, and I'm going to do something neat with them. So that's how. All this stuff gets to move. So let's look at the other parts. We have a pressure gauge, which is just a 0 to 30 PSI gauge, and it measures the pressure of whatever compressed gas is in there. Now this is measuring off of here. So that tells you what the pressure is coming out. And then one of these will be an input, one will be an output. And it should be pretty easy to figure that out from context. So we'll take the bundling off follow our tubes and see what goes where. Now, it would make sense that the regulator controls the input pressure. So if we spread this out a bit, now this is not only not connected to anything, it wasn't connected to anything. So I don't know. Because, oh no, this is our input. This is our pressure input. So we come in here through the thing, up to here, and either this or this one off. But I think this is the one that I, yeah, this is because it's that beige color. So this is pressure up to the needle head, which may be a venturi. Maybe there's a little venturi in there to suck things out and it works that way. So I'm going to say this is our input, and then we come off here, and then our regulated pressure comes out to here, and that goes down to stuff like this. So this is possibly a check valve or a filter or who knows. I'm really curious to know, because there's four different tubes going into that thing, so it's doing something. It's made by... Clippered. It's got markings on it, but they're so old and worn. It's made by Clippard in Cincinnati. That's everything I know. So that's that whole assembly there, which is all kinds of fun parts, which can have uses. I'm going to set them over here because I don't want them getting mixed in with the danger danger needle. And I should do something with the needle to ensure its safety. Hmm.
Hey, you'll do. Yeah. Okay. This is just what I had handy, but I have a matchbox and I can slip the needle between the drawer and the edge like that. And the needle only goes in that far so I know it can't come out the other side. Put a little tape on it. Just to kind of hold it on there a little bit. And it won't protect you from like someone stabbing you with it, but it'll at least keep it safe enough for now that I don't have to worry about stabbing myself, which is handy. All right, other fun parts. There's a gear motor in here, which has a million windings. This is designed to be worked on. This is a replaceable bit here. This is just a keypad, keypad and I don't know if those are really old LEDs or what, but there's Wow, there's two of them. And I'm going to set this right here on top so you guys can get a really good look at that. But these appear, they look like LEDs from long, long ago in sets of four, socket mount. Okay, here I'll set one of these down so you can see it. And I bent the pins taking it out, but these are a little, really thin dip. Like they're only a couple millimeters across. And I think they're LEDs. I've never seen LEDs like that before and those are pretty cool. So that's neat. Those get, those get to stay. And other than that, there's nothing of interest in here. A couple gears. There's a big chunky solenoid hidden down in there, but it's probably not worth digging out. So I'm going to call this one done. There's just a gear motor here, 24 volts, DC. Doesn't say what the RPM is, but it'd be kind of cool. It's three watts. Part number SP-2815. But it's just a, a thirst gear motor. And there's nothing interesting in the bottom of that at all. So that's that. This part, nothing exciting. But this stuff, all kinds of fun pneumatic bits. So this is our win out of that, and that's kind of cool. And you may see parts of this again in the future because it's totally possible with this, this little micro switch in here, one of these relays, and a little bit of metalwork to make a compressed air engine that uses this to control its timing. So like, I want you to think about that. How, how could you use, here's your fun thing to comment on. You've got a piston here. Okay, you've got a piston in a cylinder. You've got a micro switch and you've got valves. All you need is a couple days of tinkering and you could make this into a very simple engine. Comment with how you would do that because that'll be kind of fun. Now, I almost forgot, I'm gonna get rid of this giant thing. There is this thing. I have no idea what this is. And I'm really, really curious to find out. So let's dig into it a little. Cause this is neat looking. I think, think it's a pump. I think it's a precision pump and that it's powered by compressed air. That's what I think. I could be very wrong. All right. Let's go with what we know. We have two air 
connections here, red and green. They're the only red and green in an otherwise very boring beige box. And they go into this big thing here. There's a Lovejoy style connector in here. So we know that that is a shaft that rotates. And out here, there's this big thing with lots of ports on it and tubes, and we know that these tubes come and go to all different places. So this is what I think. I think that by putting compressed air into either one of these causes this shaft to rotate a very specific amount, and that causes this to pump things in or out of various tubes by very specific amounts. And either this is a pump or a rotary valve. But that's a long way to go just to valve things in and out. I think it's a pump, and I think it's designed to be a really high precision pump of things. But I kind of want to take it apart. And I don't know if I should. And I know that I don't have the right tools to take it apart in front of me. So I'm going to think about this, and if I do take it apart, that'll be in a future video. But this is a Katati, C-O-T-A-T-I, California, made in USA. 7001 appears to be the model number of whatever this is. And I think it's a pump. I think this is an air motor with a precision pump. And I'm going to mess with it and find out. Hmm. Comment, let me know. This is an interesting bit, and I want to study it. We'll have to figure this out. For now lives on a shelf. An unsolved mystery. So you guys have fun. I'm Chris Bowden, and that's today's Equipment Autopsy. We'll see you next time. If you've only seen our videos, then you've only seen the smallest fraction of what the Geek Group is. It's a place where you can craft, improve on, manufacture, repair, rediscover, test, discuss, research, and share just about any project in a one-of-a-kind massive facility with tools and equipment you might otherwise never get the chance to touch, let alone use for your own projects. The Geek Group is a learning institution. We're people with different skills, backgrounds, and perspectives, figuring out how to make ideas a reality and sharing those insights with everyone. To help you along the way and to get help from you are tens of thousands of members from around the world connected to the lab in real time through internet relay chat and live streaming video. A single-minded appetite for knowledge and a drive to create are traits common to all geeks. We found a way to amplify those traits, a way to give you the resources you need to improve lives. Get involved at thegeekgroup.org. We thank the Future Girl Foundation for the grant that made these videos possible. GIMS! And the thousands upon thousands of purchases and private donations from members and viewers like you that keep this place running. Thank you.